So welcome to this week's episode of Leaders on a Mission, where I'm joined by inspiring leaders driven by the impact of creating a healthy and sustainable world. Now, in today's episode, I'm joined by Tony Delio. Now, Tony's had a really successful career, I mean, coming on for 40 years within the food and beverage industry. But Tony's transitioning out of Ingredient, where he was a, a corporate strategy and chief innovation officer. And uh, I've got to know Tony over the years at various kind of industry events. A real privilege, uh, a real privilege to have him on the show. So, Tony, thanks very much for joining. Yeah, well, thank you, Simon. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and discussing technology trends and uh, the food industry. I, again, I do have a long perspective uh, now, 40 some odd years. Having started my the first half of my career actually working in consumer products companies, Nestle and Mars, and then kind of transitioning over to the ingredient side, kind of saw the industry from uh, you know both sides of the of the table, and uh, things have really changed. I, I mean, um, things have changed over the years. From I think when I first started, the the big food companies really controlled the retail shelf, and uh, you know, and then now that switched at some point to the big retailers and now that's switching to the internet and the consumer. So, I mean, some of the, just the basic dynamics of, of uh, who controls what, what decisions get made, how people make decisions about what they eat has, has really changed. And then, then obviously the industry's had to adopt and change accordingly. So um, yeah, I, it's, and, and we're now in this whole uh, next phase, I think of, uh, you know, uh, I would talk about that too, uh, big data, um, information and so forth that's gonna put at the fingertips uh, of people, very detailed information to help them make informed choices about what they eat, what they do, who, what, what companies they, they, they will support and who they won't support. Uh, and it changes very, very rapidly, as you know, with Twitter and, uh, and uh, Facebook and all the rest, you can, you can find yourself on the, right side or the wrong side of the equation as a, as a food manufacturer or any company for that matter. Definitely. So interesting times. It, it's really, it really has changed. I, and I got to say this, I think as a technology person, which has been most of my career, I think as well, we're in, this is the most interesting time for food, food, food and science and technology. It's really moving into another, another stage, I think, with um, the demand for more natural ingredients, the demand uh, natural foods, the demand for, and even then things like biotechnology, SynBio, and its role, sustainability and so forth. It's tremendous opportunities now for brands and products to reinvent themselves. And as a food scientist, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a, a fun time, I think, and a, a, a rejuvenated time to be in the industry. Definitely. And to, but to me, take, take it all the way back, for instance, you know, like what, what, you know, what were the main kind of, I mean, even thinking as you were kind of growing up, really, and just thinking about those key influences on you, a young Tony kind of growing up, for instance. And uh... Yeah. You know, look, I, 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 um, I, my parents grew up in, um, in New York. They were first, uh, first and second generation uh, Americans coming from, from Italy. Um, you know, so I think, you know, New York at the time, I think I'm talking the, you know, the 30s, 40s, 50s, even in the 60s, really a, a, a dynamic place. You had multiple cultures coming in. And so I was exposed to a lot of that, you know, a lot of ethnic foods, a lot of different cultures, uh, you know, many different experiences. And I think that that always made me interested, I think, in understanding about people, their culture and food in particular gives you, uh, um, you know, as an Italian, you love food, but um, food in particular gives you good insight into people and their culture. So I've always been, that was always sort of the genesis of why I was really always interested in the food industry, because it's, it says a lot about, food says a lot about the people and you learn a lot about people through their food. Yeah, no, absolutely. And tell me though, um, was, it, was it always a plan to get into the food industry, for instance? And how did, how did you come to getting your first job in, uh, in the food well, industry? Well, you, you, you remember the movie, or you may, it's a very old movie, uh, you called the graduate, right? You know, so um, yeah, absolutely. Where they they they, they bring um, uh, Dust, Dustin Hoffman aside, and he says, "Plastics." I got one word for you, son: plastics, plastics. You know, I always had a fascination in chemistry, and I, you know, I studied polymer chemistry, and I intended to go into, uh, you know, a more traditional uh, 
engineering uh, discipline, whether it was you know petroleum or plastic. And I and I actually did accept a job with Dupont, <laughs> working in plastics. And my roommate in college was um, his father actually was senior executive at Nestle. And uh, you know, I said, listen, do me a favor, just just go take an interview with us and see if this is something you'd like. And and uh, what got me interested is I basically saw all the technologies that I was studying in, in the chemical side being applied to food. And I said, wow, this is interesting. I, instead of playing around with, uh, you know, uh, petrochemicals, I could be playing around with food. So um, that's what kind of got me there. And, um, you know, it, it was a time back then, you, you, you know, when I graduated from university, you had multiple job offers, not so much anymore, but I did have the choice of a couple of different things. I ended up, it wasn't the most expensive, uh, best paying job either of the ones, the offers I had, but uh, it seemed to be the most interesting. So yeah. I, I got to apply all of my chemical engineering to food. Do you know what? I've got to make you laugh. You are the second person in the last four weeks to tell me about that film and about that clip with plastics as a conduit for driving someone's career. And it was actually a guy by the name of Nabil Sakaf, who was the, you know, the almost like chief, chief open innovation lead at Procter and Gamble. And uh, it was really that that got him into chemistry uh, as well and, and literally kind of created his whole career. So amazing kind of influence this film has had in kind of at least 80 years worth of kind of career dedication, basically. It's <laughs> well, I think the, the main message of that is to pick something in focus, right? That that is pick a pick a discipline. Try to try to anticipate the future where things are going, what the needs are. Pick a thing, make a bet, and focus. Now, I mean, obviously, many years later, you'd probably pick you know computer science, right? And now now you might pick biotechnology. I, I mean, it's gonna it's gonna change over time. But at that time, that that was uh, it. And I remember, you know, the highest paid jobs out of university were chemical engineers, you know, more than electrical engineers, more than chemists. Uh, um, computer science was just, you know, getting started. It was there, but it wasn't that, that, that now it's, you know, entirely different today than it was uh, when I when I graduated. But it, I think it's, I think it is important. If I, if I had to advise somebody um, coming, graduating today, you know, do something that you love. Uh, you know, try to pick the future because you want to make sure you don't pick a dead end, something that's going to come to a dead end, but do something that you love and put your passion into it. And I think that's a, that, that message was in that film. So that's why I think it's had an impact. And I, it's one of the more, I guess, famous clips uh, from that film is quoted by a lot of people. Yeah, no, that's great. And so tell me, with nearly 40 years then in the food industry, and you think, I know that you were very much on the consumer side and, you know, so you've seen both sides of that kind of value chain. Maybe, maybe pick for me, you know, when you reflect back really fondly on either a job or a project or a time that, you know, that gives you a lot of satisfaction and happiness when you reflect, maybe, maybe outline what that. Uh, what yeah, that I'll give you two. I'll give you two examples earlier in my career. So first, I think, you know, I, I, I went to work to, for Mars Incorporated uh, about two years after I graduated. I went to Nestle first. And at Mars at the time, they, they wanted to get into extruded and get into snacks, you know, to savory snacks. Very faint, obviously, you know them for all the confectionery products and so forth. But they really wanted to get into the savory snacks. And they had bought some technology in a company called, uh, Com they formed a company, it was Combos was the product. And it's a, a pretzel filled with cheese. And, and then they wanted to evolve that to get into other things. And so um, they came to me, I knew nothing about extrusion or inset. We want to get into extrusion. We'd like you to explore that. Uh, and they literally gave me an a, a, a extruder that they had rented with no feeder. And I had, I had my technician there. We had styrofoam cups lined up with a, the, the material that we were feeding through this thing and a stopwatch. And we would dump it in every so often. And we'd run for about 10 minutes and the thing would lock up. And so fast forward, that you know, they gave me completely the, the, uh, the, the space, the money and so forth. Uh, we started, uh, you know, uh, bought some more equipment. Uh, we made some very interesting products, uh, brought them to market it within less than a year. I, I was responsible for the launch of the product from a technical side, from setting up all the vendors. I was responsible for manufacturing at a pilot scale then the design and scale up to a, a plant. And then, you know, a couple of years later, uh, you know, a $15 million investment. And I'm, this is a young guy, I'm 25 years old at this time. So, you know, that to me was, um, 
you know, basically, you know, empower people, give them the, give them the opportunity, give them the space, give them the support. Um, obviously, you have to hold them to deliver, but um, very rewarding. Um, and you know, for me, at 25 years old, I was actually had the honor then to have dinner with one of the one of the owners of the business, John Mars. Uh, and this was one of the most. This was actually the most successful plant startup of Mars Incorporated at that point in time. So uh, very rewarding experience. The second one takes me to your part of the woods, to the UK. Uh, and I was, I was involved with uh, a lot of the new products again for Mars. And we uh, developed the Mars ice cream business. Uh, as you may recall, the Mars ice cream was very successful in the UK. And uh, we built a factory in France outside of Strasbourg and you know, ground up Greenfield site. and. Uh, Got that running at, at, at that time, you know, a lot of money, $20 million, build a factory. And um, it was completed on time and um, it was very interesting. And I learned a lot that I also learned a lot about cultures because you, it was an interesting team that built this. We had, you know, obviously French folks, we had English people, we had Germans, we had Dutch, we had the odd Italian, um, you know, I, and watching this team come together and work. Um, some of the stereotypes that we all we all hold uh, in the back of our head about the different cultures come to bear, but uh, it was great to see that team work and everything. I learned so much about myself, about and it was so much it's so much fun and to build a business that we built that was over two hundred million pounds within a few years of sales. So it was a great it was a great uh, it was a great opportunity. So those are two, and there's there's many more I could go on later in my in my career. Um, uh, you know, even you know, clear, clearly, uh, we talked earlier about the innovation and building innovation at Ingredion and what it is today. That you know, that was that's been a lot of fun and it's very rewarding to see that. It's a really rewarding to also see, particularly the people and the people develop and advance. And I can look at all the people that worked for me and and uh, over the years, and many of them, uh, you know, obviously have succeeded and done very very well. And that's that's very rewarding. Ultimately, I I think you as you move in your career. Your your own focus and what's important and what you deliver is different. So you're you're de you're delivering products and you're involved in the technology and now you're you're helping people to succeed in delivering products and technologies move on. So your 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 focus is how do I enable people to how do I do the work myself? That's that's a natural progression to see in your career. Yeah, that is uh, yeah absolutely absolutely that's great and that's really good to to get some kind of context as it were and um and so so when you think back now to you know where we are right now uh from the food industry viewpoint and you think about consumer trends and the things yeah. going on what, what do you think the biggest ch changes have been within the industry you, you know i you you prompted me by sending me a couple of questions to prepare for this and um you know i look back over some of the um I did some interviews, you know, 25 years ago. I've written some, you know, I, I looked at some of my notes about some of the trends. I've, I've actually made multiple presentations and trends. And it's very interesting. And I go back to one, it was really my first sort of industry interview, um, probably the mid nineties. And it was with Food Processing Magazine, if you remember, you remember uh, that, that, that magazine. Um, and they said, what are the, what are the trends in, in, that are there? And I think, you know, I, I, some, first of all, convenience. It was, it was top of mind 25 years ago, and that led, and I said food service and how that was going to explode. Um, that's kind of happened, right? And, and the need for, you know, driven by more working families, you know, both spouses, uh, you know, working uh, and not having time. Um, and it was, it was interesting. I remember some statistics that I, I presented at a, a internal internal uh, conference and strategy meeting in 1900 the average meal took about three hours to to prepare and 30 something ingredients by 1975 it was down to you know the 50s it was down to an hour and something and the 75 to 30 minutes and today it's you know uh, maybe five or six components that you put together and you know 20 20 minutes whatever time it takes to cook so it's a uh, obviously there are people that cook from scratch and do it for enjoyment too but uh, that that's the daily grind so that was another one that was important and i think i think i, I also called out uh, ethnic food and if you think about the 
explosion of ethnic food. It was in the 90s. You know, before that, and you guys were eating bangers and beans and we were eating, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs over here, right? So um, there, wasn't, there wasn't much change. And if you think about, you know, you know Asian food was some, some horrible Chinese takeout, you know, in your neighborhood. Uh, Thai food was a, you know, maybe a pizza place. Obviously, the big cities, you had different situations. But uh, for most of us, it was, there wasn't ethnic food. Now you've got tremendous diversity in, in food. And that was something that was coming at the time. And then the last area I, I, I focused, focused on was um, eating responsibility, uh, eating responsibly and, and, and selecting the foods that you want. So this is 25 years ago. So I, I uh, you know, a lot of that is, is certainly, is certainly happened. Um, a few years later, I did an inter interview and it was about biotechnology and how that was going to be a change. Now, obviously it took over 20 years for that to really get going, but you could see it. You could see it because it offers the opportunity to nature, identical, sustainable, uh, food ingredients, right? Things that, you know, and people want to eat natural, right? They want to eat natural. Um, so I think, you know, rather than saying of the trends, uh, sorry, the, the trends changed, I think they've actually more evolved, you know, different things have, have they've evolved and developed over time. Um, and I, I still think that, you know, this idea of convenience is, is just so important. People do not have time. And you think about, you know, okay, it was meal kits at some point in time. It was uh, hamburger helper if you, in the U.S. years and years ago, you know. But then some more sophisticated meal kits. And now it's just people eating out. Why do people eat out? It's just so convenient. You, you can go online, you can click, you can take away. And I mean, COVID's probably, you know, obviously uh, made some of that even facilitated that to, to a greater extent. But I, I think that this whole convenience thing is, is, is going to take, uh, continue to be an issue, right? Or a, a trend. So, uh, and at food service, which was maybe 50% of, of sales in the U.S. dollar-wise of consumer dollar spend, probably much less now, but you know it'll come back. Does it come back to the same extent? I don't know. We can talk about COVID at the moment, but that, that's for sure. I think the other thing that I probably didn't see, and I think that's going to be very implemented, is is the whole information technology piece, right? That that didn't really exist. Um, you know, 25 years ago, we were just getting our first websites. It was uh, AOL. You got mail. I remember those movies, uh, you know, with uh, Tom Hanks and, and so forth. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was, but now putting all this power at people's fingertips, you know, from a consumer standpoint, but also as an as a manufacturer or a, a, a researcher, we're beginning to do more and more of experimentation. You know, using using information. You know, we're designing experiments before we ever run them to zero in where we need to do in silico rather than you know vitro. Um, and I think that that's, that's a big thing. Automation, you know, and that, that's another, another observation I will make. When I first joined Mars Incorporated, if you went into a, uh, a factory and you went into, uh, you know, the packaging line, you would have, you know, 30, 40 people taking the bars and moving them into boxes, taking the boxes, putting them into cases, taking the cases, putting, taping them up, putting them on a pallet, somebody taking the pallet away. That's completely automated now. There's one person walking around, it's all done. And I think, you know, that level of automation has, has, has moved back. So the nature of work is gonna change, uh, you know, has changed quite a bit. And so I think there's further automation to occur. And I think with information technology it allows us to make, you know, you know better decisions, uh, better, 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 better automation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's amazing what you said. You were talking about convenience back in 95, where it feels like it's something relatively new, doesn't it? You know, just thinking about it for me, it feels like maybe it's something over the last 10 years. Incredible to think that, uh, you know, that's been there for 20 years, as it were, you know, in terms yeah. of one of those. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll read you what, I, what my quote was. That, you know, um, there was a whole new generation of consumers who've grown up not knowing how to cook, they just, just don't know how to cook, and, and um, you know they're looking for these solutions to help them manage their life and lifestyle. And it, it was about the definition of quality was around freshness, uh, which is interesting as well. And uh, you know, consumer manufacturer provide convenient meal solutions which don't sacrifice taste or quality 
we'll win in the long term is what you know I would I was saying. So I think it's it, it is it is interesting, but I, I I think you you know even back when I started my career it was all about convenience. That was that was that was key. I just think what convenience is 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 changed. You know, do I prepare anything? And you think about you know hamburger helper, you still actually have to open the box, you know, do something to it, maybe customize it a little bit. Ordering from a restaurant, you just show up, pick it up, and, <laughs> and, and come home. So it's it's an entirely diff, different thing. And, and you know, in some parts of the world, you go to China and so forth. You know, where you have, uh, you know, I think are already 65 percent of the meals they consume are are prepared out of home, right? And the food is cheap, uh, relatively inexpensive. Um, you know, it's a different it's a different thing. I, I I think we're moving in that direction. Now, I would say. This counter trend, and I think COVID, this whole COVID situation is a counter trend because we all ate at home, we all prepared at home. People are realizing, well, I, I could actually save a little bit of money, certainly doing that, but also the family time together. And now, does that does that quickly revert back when we're free to travel, when we're free to do things? I don't know. I, I you know, I got to I got to think, and I haven't seen the statistics that the amount of money that's being spent was spent last year, probably not out yet, on food out of home where it was over 50% in the US, probably around 30, 40%, I would say in Europe, someplace in the mid, the high 30s, early 40s, a little less in Europe, uh, had to go down to half for that or less, right? And um, does it come back? I, I don't know. That, that'll be it, how fast it comes back. It will come back, but how fast it comes back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, the, the convenience factor now, uh, certainly in the UK, when it comes to, you know, you've got young kids growing up and, getting the apps and pressing a click and literally the food arriving five minutes later, it doesn't get any more convenient than literally. Yeah. Drop the, other, the other thing I would say, looking back at my trends, there was, you know, maybe a few years later, we were talking about nutraceuticals and functional food. Right. And, um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I had, I had a presentation I made a couple of times talking about the seven trends. And one of them on there was that, you know, when it comes to food, well, people will pay for pills, but not for food. They want their food, the nutrition and food to become natural. And I think that's the case today. I mean, even more so. I think, um, you know, you look at this, the, the, the new generation coming into the, the workforce and having money, they're very concerned about what they're eating. They're eating for long-term health. They're worried about nutrition. They're much more aware about all this. I think the apps and all this data that's available will, supports all that. But I do think that people are are really are a good percentage. And I remember doing some segmentation studies that show that people that, you know, actually consciously chose foods on the basis of its nutrition, nutrition and, and other factors. And this is, you know, again, 25 years ago, about 12% of the public actively did that. And I, I've seen numbers now that that's, you know, well over 30, 40, approaching 40% of consumers in the U.S. that are, you know, consciously paying attention to the food and making selections, maybe trading off on convenience or maybe trading off a little bit, not too much, but trading off a little bit on, on, on taste even for something that tastes, that's something that's more nutritious. So I think that's a, that's one that's going to, that's one that's probably, it was there, there were, in, in, you know, you know, eating responsibility, as I said, responsibly selecting foods that provide long, long-term health and well-being. And I talked about that 25 years ago, but I think that's one that's really, really also accelerating. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that's not going to go away. Yeah, and, and what do you think about the 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 environmental consumer? You know, yeah, think about that trend now. When you, I'm picturing when you were there with your innovation plans ten years ago, for instance, you know, and you were thinking about the uh, the veggie burger at the time or the alternative. You know, was there? Um, you know, could you have believed that we were going to have this kind of this trend and this movement yeah. towards the plant based. No, I think you're. I think you're absolutely right. I think this this whole thing of, um, I would say, mindful eating. That's what I've heard somebody quoted as is is being conscious about the nutrition, where the food's coming from, how it was prepared, or delivered, and you know, and where it's you know how far it's come to get to you. You know, some of that was around. Right? Even when I lived in the UK, or, or shortly after that. They were there were retailers were putting the number of miles on packages of the food how food come to get to you right so people were beginning to become conscious of that I, I do think that this generation particularly with you know uh, climate change and so forth is 
even more aware of this and recognizes that they they have to do that. I do the whole thing about vegetarian and, and meatless uh, for a variety of reasons. There, people did it. Uh, now, oh, I think people always did it for animal welfare to some degree. People did it for health, but now it's it's really it's really uh, caught on. I mean, the number of uh, no, people even just cutting down on, on, on meat and having less meat and meatless meals or meatless Mondays or whatever they call that, you know, uh, uh, trying to cut back. I think that's here to stay. So I do believe you're absolutely right. I think um, this whole thing of social responsibility, personal responsibility, the environment, it all kind of kind of comes together. Um, and I think the sustainability agenda um I think becomes more important to companies. I, I just saw, you know, my uh, ingredient yesterday just announced uh, with with uh, with Danone a new program on sustainability, and I think you're going to see more of these these sorts of partnerships and more of these things to do. And the industry needs to come together to do that. You know, I, I will say that the food industry has probably been less. That's a big opportunity for the food industry. I've talked about this before with you know openly in, in interviews and so forth. I, I don't think we're a collaborative industry, not as other industries are. I said we have this secret sauce mentality that, you know, the formulation around a product or how it's made or something is so special that we don't want to let that out of the bag. And that leads to them not sharing of information. But if we're going to crack the sustainability thing, if we're going to crack some of these, those partnerships, you're going to, we're going to have to make partnerships and you're going to have to select. You can't be everything to everybody. You can't be a partner with everything. Right. And that's, that's, it's changing. It's changing because I think um, people recognize you can't do it all internally anymore. The budgets aren't there. Uh, the, 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 the ability to do it, the, the, the amount of time, the technology is, is, fasting, is advancing so fast outside of companies and, and entrepreneurs and so forth. You got to tap into all that. So you got to form those, 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 those uh, connections. I do believe that's an opportunity that's, that's only going to accelerate. I actually, uh, I, again, looking back at my notes, and I'm not trying to say I was predicting everything, but I did do a, a, an interview again, uh, you know, back in 98 that talked about the change in, in the, and I think the interview was about slashing and of R&D and what does that mean? And, and the need to do, you know, do more partnerships and to look to universities, to look to, to the startup companies. Startup companies, probably not as much, they weren't around as much as they are today, right? The money there to fund this is incredible. Um, but looking outside because it's, it's, it's going to be, you know, we don't have the resources internally. So I think the food industry does need to change. It does need to evolve. I think it is. You're seeing companies do it. I had, um, you know, opportunity to discuss this not too long ago with uh, Stefan Palzer, who's the uh, chief innovation officer at Nestle. And, and he's really trying to take Nestle, the big behemoth, the big ship, and kind of turn it on its head and say, how do we become faster, more, you know, you know, more innovative? How do we become entrepreneurial and setting up, you know, uh, entrepreneurial hub there in Switzerland near, you know, to try to encourage um, the, the faster, this faster pace and more risk taking. Um, Absolutely. I, and, and Tony, as well, just on that, um, just two things you've said there. Um, first of all, was that, did you see that very much as, because agree the honor of, pretty traditional company right where they've come from was that part of what you were doing there to encourage them to look a little bit more externally as opposed to internal was that very much how you saw your you know yes what... yeah no i we did i think i think it's it's clear and there's some things i obviously can't talk about because it's confidential but there's a lot of bets that we've made on in new technology spaces by engaging with startup companies, engaging with universities and so forth to kind of bring that in. We do have a small group inter internally that's just focused on external technology, um, you know, and um, the company obviously is, is clearly laid out, you know, publicly the bets that it's making around, you know, protein, around uh, plant-based proteins, around sugar reduction, um, and even in systems, you know, and coming together with, with new uh, solutions that are all around speed. So I, I think those are, and, and to accomplish a lot of that, we're going to, you know, we can't do it all internally. There's no way you can do it all eternally, even with the, yeah, even if you try, uh, maybe a Nestle could do it. I mean, they've got the, the, the bandwidth, the resource, but it, they, they struggle. I, I would say, you know, if you look at what big companies reward and what they look for, um, 
know, they look for expertise in a particular area and they then they reward success for sure. And they really kind of punish failure. Right? They, they want to say, you know, acceptable number of failures is acceptable and we take risks and so forth. But really, in generally, they're not risk, risk you know, they're very risk averse. If you look at a, an entrepreneurial company, yes, you need to be the expert. They're looking for experts to, to be in those companies, but you got to be so much more. You definitely have to be a jack of or Jill of all trades. You, you, you got to take on other roles and other hats. You got to think more of the business consequences and so, rather than your vertical, you know, ex level of expertise. And you get rewarded big time for success. The company goes public, you share, you know, you, you share that and you're encouraged to take risk. And, you know, if a company fails and you've got to go find a new job, it's, it's not considered a, a, a badge of shame, right? It's, hey, we tried this, it didn't work, but I moved on to the next thing, yeah. right? So it's, it's a different mindset, it's a different level of person. And, that, and that's why these, you know, like the, the many, I think if you're going to play in this space, you've got to, and as a big company, you've got to make multiple bets. It's just like having an investment portfolio, right? Some of these things are going to not play out. And some of them are one or two of them. All you need is one or two to do well. And you, you know, you, you, you got a home run. Um, and that's actually the strategy that, that in, ingredient is, is, is uh, employed as we look to both the, the, the plant-based proteins and the um, sugar reduction uh, as making multiple bets in that space. Yeah. With some of them we've made a public announced. For example, you know, we're, we've started up now the facility in South Sioux City that's making, you know, P, the P isolate. Uh, we, we, we made an investment up in Canada in a company called Verdiant uh, Foods, uh, which is doing other types of protein products. Uh, we made an investment in, in Clara Foods, which is doing, you know, using Synbio to, to produce egg protein from yeast. So um, trying to cover the gambit. Now, I, I think all of them will have a role. And I hope, I think all those three will be successful, I'm sure. Uh, and there are others that we've made that we haven't announced. But um, I think if you're going to go in these spaces as a big company, you, you, you can't just go with one thing. You got to make multiple bets. Yeah. Yeah. No, great. Great. And as a, a you know, technologist and someone always really interested, you know, in the science, it must, you must be like a kid in the candy store when you're looking at all this, you know, the, the power and the technology and the potential of, uh, of what it can do and how quickly it evolves and moves. Right. I mean, it's uh I mean, look, I, it's it's impossible to. This is where I, we were talking earlier. It's impossible to kind of uh, one person to kind of understand it all. So you do have to build some pillars of expertise around understanding nutrition, around understanding biotechnology, around other 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 aspects of things, so that you 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 can at least as, assess and make intelligent decisions about where you want to play. You don't need to have the experts. There are going to be multiple people out there that do that. And, Let's just take, I'll give you an example. Let's just take the, the whole Synbio. It really comes down, you know, these companies that are, are getting yeast and other organisms to produce nature-based or natural identical ingredients, whether it's vanilla or a, a preservative or a coloring agent or a, a protein. Um, you know, one technology they have technology around modifying that particular thing and it can only do so many things. So if you wanna do something else, you probably need a different, you need to go somewhere else for that technology. So I think that that is why making these multiple bets and keeping yourself flexible, even entrepreneurial, if you will, within a big company allow, and you've got the resources. You, I mean, theoretically you have the resources and the money to do this. Um, if you're on the other side of the equation with a, with a, uh, a startup, um, this stuff, and particularly around food, there's, there's a le another level of complexity. This isn't like you know, whipping up a, a, a program or an app to do this, that, or the other thing where you could try it, it doesn't work. And, you, know, you try something, it doesn't work, you kill somebody, food, right? So you, you can't even try it. So you, you got to get the, you know, you got to get all the science right. You got to get the, the yields right. You got to get the cost right because, you know, you're not going to pay, you know, $150 a pound for, you know, plant-based for, for a protein. You, you got to get that where it's affordable with, with, with things. Uh, even if you, you don't want to kill an animal uh, to get your protein, uh, your egg protein or your meat protein, uh, you, you, there's some limit of what you're going to spend to do that. So I, I think, um, and there are many alternatives. I, I, I do think that that's, that's the key. It's time and money for the startup companies. Do they have enough time? Do they have enough money to 
to get it right. And um, and that's and, and and the other thing is find an early success. Pick targets that may not be where they want to be long term. They, so I, I you know I give you an example, and it's again public information. Clara Foods is clearly stated egg proteins if they want to be. When you think about egg white proteins on a dry weight basis, about twenty five dollars a, a a kilogram, right? Is what it what it costs. Um, you know, some of these proteins, you're, you're talking hundreds of dollars just to produce. So the first one they're producing is a, is a product called pepsin, which is a, a, a you know, a, 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 a basically an enzyme um, used in many different things, industrial things. It's also a supplement where you can command a $200, $300 selling price because that's what it costs for those things. So pick those things, get your technology right, get your supply chain right, make some money. Right, uh, and then move on to the bigger things because it takes a long time to scale this up, and, and it takes money and, and time to do it. So I think um, you know those are the challenges I think that the, yeah. the, the food tech companies face, right? Yeah. And the ones that are really bringing technology, right? That's yeah, crazy. no, absolutely. And 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 I would figure as well that when I dealt with quite a few CEOs or early stage startups that have got some great technology, they're not always aware of the food industry and how things work and you know, the, necessarily the, you know, the, the way to conduct business, as it were. And, uh, you know, they might be entrepreneurs, they wouldn't necessarily have worked in the, in the industry and in the business. And it's always a healthy tension between what's possible and what's feasible from the investors and the pace that things go with in the food industry, right? Which is generally quite slow, isn't it, uh, in terms of adoption? Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's true. You know, I think... Um... I think the pace has increased in, in terms of consumers accepting things. I mean, you can call it the whole the whole foods effect, and it's been around for 20 years, where they were, you know, accepting smaller brands, newer products, different products. Mm. Um, I think that's changed now that Amazon's taken taken over. But um, yeah, I think if you know, I, NPD, which is uh, I can't remember what they did, but it's a consumer research company, a large one that measures trends in food eating. They track what Americans eat. And, um, you know, I, I remember listening to, to them. And, and, you know, if you look at the top 10 foods for dinner, it doesn't change very much over 10 years or 20 years. You, know? you got pizza in there. You got a ham sandwich in there. You've got hot dogs, I think, fell out. But they, at one point, they were in. Things come in and come out for sure. But you know, getting people to fundamentally, the mass, the, the big, to change what they eat is tough. I do think it's happening more rapidly for the very reasons we discussed earlier. I think the whole sustainability thing, I think this next generation about health, healthy, healthy eating, natural, um, clean and simple, you know, uh, uh, non-animal non protein, all those types of things are, um, you know, are probably driving it a little faster than maybe it would have occurred. Look at look at Beyond Meat and Impossible. How much you know they've grown in a very short period of time. You know, I I I worked at ADM uh, 20 years ago actually and ran their soy protein, amongst other their soy soy protein business. And they were making a very acceptable um, they had a food service operation. You know, plant based burger, which they sold to McDonald's and for a test in, in in stores in New York. And it went on for like two years and McDonald's could never pull the trigger to expand. Um, you know, back then it was around soy and heart health and all those healthy, those, those claims, which I think have gone by the wayside. Functional food, I think is dead. It's, I think it's not, it's not about, it's about natural nutrition and it's not about functional foods and claims about food, I, I think are, are kind of dead, especially in this country. Uh, other places J in J Japan, you have Foshu, you have they, they still exist. So, I, but I think it's I think it, the, the the pace of change and what people eating is change is faster than it was, you know, maybe maybe 10, 20 years ago for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So, Tony, listen, it's been brilliant. I've really enjoyed the chat. I could chat with you all day about this, and and yeah. uh, thanks for uh, taking the time and uh, and bringing such wisdom to the discussion. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, I did as well. Thank you very much for having me on.